Welcome to the transport seminar at McGill. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Evelyn uh, Blumenberg. Uh, she's the director of the Lewis Center uh, for Regional uh, Policy and Studies uh, and an urban planning professor with, uh, within the Laskin School of uh, Public Affairs. Uh, her research examines the effects of urban structure, spatial location, resident, uh, residence employment and services on economic outcomes. Uh, low wage workers, uh, all of us have read her work and all of us get inspired by it. So it's a pleasure to, to that she's with us today. And uh, welcome Evelyn, um, thank you. Thanks, thanks so much Ahmed and, and thanks for inviting me and thanks everybody for attending this lecture uh, this afternoon or in my case uh, this, this morning. It's, it seems like a terrific lecture uh, uh, series. Um, as this uh, slide shows, I'm going to be talking uh, this afternoon about equity and automobility. Um, it is always a hard topic to discuss in an audience of planners and environmentalists and others who have concerns about automobiles and, uh, and, and cities. And uh, planners certainly have a complicated relationship when it comes to the, the automobile. So planners for decades have helped to create auto-centric cities. And here in parentheses is a list, uh, you know, some examples of the, the ways that, uh, that planners and engineers have, have done this. And then certainly now many cities are moving away from car-based planning, uh, trying to develop cities uh, in more sustainable uh, ways. And I've also, you know, sort of listed, I'm sure, some of the approaches that you all are, are, are familiar with. Um, there's a good reason for the concern about automobiles, you know, so automobiles come with a lot of costs. You can see it in the cartoon on the, on the, on the right um, and the list on the left. You know, environmental externalities, congestion, sprawl, high expenditure, uh, sort of transportation expenditure burden, uh, expenditures on roads and highways relative, for example, to other modes, issues with uh, sort of safety, so crashes and, and police stops, which we've been uh, sort of hearing a lot about these days, uh, health, you know, sort of negative health implications, um, its impact on other modes. And then, you know, a number of other uh, sort of externalities, and I've listed those in the, the, the bottom uh, sort of row. And I'm sure you all can think of, of others. Um, so I just want to lay that out um, and then transition uh, to the fact and, and my sort of major argument uh, today is that there are important uh, equity implications uh, related to automobility. And I am going to focus on, uh, on four, uh, sort of four arguments or four points. So the first is that in cities built around automobiles, households without access to them are at a significant disadvantage. I'm going to come back to all of these. Um, the second is uh, modal access gaps has, have grown over time. So I'm going to talk generally about that. And it seems hard to have this uh, presentation at the, you know, at a time when we're in the middle of this big health pandemic. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about cars and, and COVID. The third is that the benefits of automobiles to low income families are, are widely recognized, even if planners uh, sort of struggle uh, with this. And then I'm going to end uh, very briefly at the end. Uh, by talking about how it's possible to have your cake and eat it too, potentially, um, it, that there are potential strategies to pursue equity, equity, sustainability, and automobility. And I'm going to end on, on that, maybe come full, full circle. Okay, so I'm going to come back to all four of these. So first, in cities built around automobiles, households without uh, access to cars are at a significant disadvantage. And so there are numerous benefits of automobiles. I just listed, you know, saw a similar table about the costs, and now I'm going to turn to the benefit side of the equation. 
Uh, and the first is reduced time costs. So faster speeds, shorter travel times, and greater access to destinations. And, and so here, uh, these are uh, data from folks at the University of, of Minnesota. Um, and we can see that cars provide greater access to jobs than public transit. Um, the bars are you know, fairly, at least for the US, fairly transit rich uh, sort of metropolitan areas. And it shows the ratio of jobs accessible in 60 minutes by auto relative to public transit. So where I'm sitting right now, um, Los Angeles, you can see that that ratio is 13 to one, a little over 13 to one. So 13 times as much access to, uh, to jobs in 60 minutes by automobile than by public transit. Even in New York, you know, people say, oh, well, Los Angeles is an outlier. You know, there, there's always been, you know, sort of a very auto-centric city. Um, but those disparities even exist in, uh, in again, here in a U.S. context, uh, in places like New York, where that uh, sort of ratio is four times, and in uh, back in California and San Francisco, the Bay Area, uh, almost six times uh, the, the disparity. Um, there are other uh, sort of benefits of, of automobiles. Um, so the ease of making trips to multiple destinations on a single tour is one. Uh, clearly very important for women who have to balance oftentimes household and work responsibilities. It's also, and I'll come back to this point a little bit later, it's also really important in engaging in job search, for example, where you have to string multiple trips together often. Uh, cars can be convenient. You leave when you want, door-to-door -door travel. You can carry large packages. Uh, you know, potentially uh, sort of easier travel with children. Uh, protected from the weather. Um, there are safety issues associated with automobiles, certainly, and, and important ones, um, but automobiles can also provide safety, traveling at night, so women often mention this is really important, uh, the ability to get, a, uh, get into a car rather than wait at a bus stop uh, late at night, um, and now lots of discussion about the ability to socially distance in automobiles relative to, to buses and, and trains. Um, cars provide shelter. So I actually have another project now looking at uh, sort of the vehicular homeless uh, in, in Los Angeles. And then certainly lots of folks have been right, you know, have written about the other benefits uh, of automobiles related to sort of pleasure and status and, and, and all of that. Um, what we do know is that low income and non-white households are less likely to own cars than higher income white households. So they're less likely to reap the, all those benefits. And so that's what you see here. Um, these are data, again, you know, my apologies for you know, all the, the US uh, sort of data. Um, so these are data from the 2017 National Household uh, sort of travel survey um, on the, you know, the first bar are uh, individuals who live in households with incomes less than $25,000, which is about the bottom income quintile. You can see about a quarter, more than a quarter of them uh, don't have automobiles. Uh, rates of zero vehicle households are very high among non-white individuals as, as well, and particularly high uh, among uh, Blacks. There's a growing body of research that shows that the benefits of automobiles are associated with a number of important outcomes. And the one that I have done the most work on relates to employment. And the, there are a lot of arrows on this schematic and the arrows go in multiple directions. And I will talk about all of them. Um, but the literature certainly shows, I'm gonna come back to this point in a minute, certainly, when you have higher income or you get more income, that enables you to purchase an automobile, right? So there, that, that arrow goes in that direction. Um, but even sort of controlling for that relationship, which is certainly true, uh, studies find that automobiles, the having the automobile uh, is associated with positive employment outcomes. 
Um, and I mentioned before, it's, you know, for many of the reasons that I talked about, it's, you know, easier to do job search. It's potentially easier to commute. It's easier to arrive at work on time consistently. I mentioned the, you know, the benefit of managing home and, and work responsibilities. Um, this slide is not really meant to be read. It's only meant to be suggestive that there are many, many studies in many, many contexts. These are the, the US studies, but they're also international studies as well um, that show the association between cars and employment outcomes. So it's not an aberration. Uh, there's a growing body of, of, of research, different population groups, different places, different locations, all showing this relationship between cars and employment outcomes, particularly among uh, low-income groups uh, as well as non-white uh, adults as, as well. Um, studies show that automobiles are associated with other positive outcomes as well. So I've mentioned doing the most on the sort of employment side of things, but there's work that looks at cars and uh, living in the ability to live in higher quality neighborhoods, uh, intergenerational economic outcomes, access to healthcare services, access to high quality education, and, uh, and on. Okay, so that was point number one. Point number two is that the modal access gap between cars and transit uh, has grown uh, over time. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, sort of in the, in the future. Um, and in part because of continuing suburbanization of households and jobs, and then, as I mentioned, you know, I'll, I'll say a few words about this current health crisis uh, sort of as, as well. So these, again, once again, data on the U.S. looking at the uh, suburbanization of poverty. Um, and so you can see that on this graph, the whatever color that looks like to you, red, I guess. Um, so you can see that sort of the growth in the, the number of uh, low-income individuals uh, who are living in, in suburbs uh, over, over time. And we've had a parallel uh, sort of process that's happened as well um, with growing employment dispersion uh, as, as well. So on the left, you see the data on employment by uh, sort of distance from the, the central business district. Um, and on the right, some analysis done at the Brookings Institution looking at the decline in job proximity uh, by race, ethnicity, and poverty as well. And you can see that the, sort of the big decline in job proximity is among Blacks, Hispanics, uh, and, and, and the poor. Now that's not to say, and I'm not sure whether, you know, uh, the, the speakers have been talking about this, that's not to say that there isn't some densification happening, right? So I often tell my students, we have sort of two things happening at the same time. We have some agglomeration that's happening in and around downtown areas in particular, you know, in, and we've been looking at some of this in California, both related to population, you know, young folks moving into uh, sort of neighborhoods in and around downtown, uh, jobs as well in some uh, in some uh, sort of cities, um, but at the same time we continue to have dispersion certainly in some of the outlying areas in, in metropolitan areas, and so we see both of those trends happening at the at the same time. Let me talk just a little bit about the the COVID crisis as it relates to modal disparities and uh, the automobile in in particular. So we know that low-income and non-white workers are least likely to be able to telework. And so lots of there's been uh, sort of lots of uh, sort of data collection uh, sort of around that. Uh, this is just one uh, sort of the ability. This is sort of you know pre-COVID, so the ability to uh, to telework by income and race and ethnicity. Um, on the left are earnings, you know, full-time earnings by, by quartile. And you can see those in the top quartile, 62% are able to telework uh, relative to only 9% among those in the bottom quartile in terms of earnings. Uh, and then you can see some of the, the differences as well by uh, sort of race and, uh, and eth 
ethnicity with black and Hispanics uh, sort of least likely to be able to, to telework. Low income and non-white workers are most likely also to have been laid off due to this pandemic. And so that's what you see here, uh, uh, sort of data looking at whether the respondent themselves or someone in their household uh, lost a job due to COVID. Again, you know, categories of income on the left, categories of race and ethnicity on, on the right. And you can see about a third of lower income households uh, and about the same of Hispanic households either had been laid off or someone in their household had, had been laid off. So those without a car are at a disadvantage uh, in this pandemic as well. So one, which I talked about already, is the difficulty of searching for jobs without a car. Um, the second is uh, access to COVID-related services, goods, and activities. And um, so in addition to facilitating you know, travel for work that I've talked about, the car has been elevated during this pandemic as the means to accessing other COVID related uh, services, goods and activities. My friends and colleagues will tell you that I've had a minor obsession with all the car focused activities around COVID. In fact, I just talked about this earlier this week in another talk and I got a whole round of emails of people sending me pictures about other car related COVID activities, but I have, um, I've listed a few of them here. And if you have others you wanna send my way, um, I would appreciate it. Um, so one is drive-through COVID testing. Um, and we did actually in LA, some analysis of where the drive-through testing was related to the walk-through testing, you know, sort of walk-up testing, um, you know, to kind of look at access to COVID testing. Um, food donations, so this is here in LA, in Inglewood, uh, looking at cars, you know, sort of lined up for food donations. Certainly we have drive-through food. I put Starbucks, but there's, we could, you know, sort of pick your drive-through of choice. Um, jobs, you know, one of the growing sectors is, you know, the delivery of things, right? Uh, and so cars are certainly associated with some of those. Uh, here's a picture of someone, I, I bet some of you have done this, uh, working in your vehicle, so cars is workspace, cars is access to the internet, so there are, you know, sort of Wi-Fi uh, sort of disparities as well. Uh, worship, uh, this is also in Southern California, so these are not, you know, these are RVs um, used for homeless housing, for example, so it's explicit uh, sort of program to house the homeless. Uh, and uh, there's concerts, there's a whole, you know, sort of group uh, around entertainment. This just has to do with the, the you know, sort of drive-in uh, sort of movies. Um, land use is so, land is so expensive in California. Those have, have uh, largely disappeared over time. They existed when I was, uh, when I was young, um, but now they're being set up in parking lots, uh, uh, you know, sort of store parking lots and, and, and whatnot. Um, so the third is at the same time as we have this sort of growing use for automobiles during this pandemic, we have health fears that may limit travel by transit and reduce access to, to opportunities for the reasons I talked about uh, sort of before. And we do know that transit use remains lower than in the pre-COVID period. This is just, there's been a, a lot of data on this. This is, the, these data come from the the US Apple routing requests by mode. And so the, the red line here is transit routing requests. Uh, and then you can see the, uh, you know, the, the other two uh, as, a, as well. And you can see that a sort of a, a big bounce back in travel by other sort of modes um, and some bounce, bounce back by public transit. Um, but still not nearly back to where we were at the beginning of the, of the calendar year or, you know, right before the, the pandemic. Um, and then we were just actually, I think, chit-chatting about this right before this session, that unfortunately, you know, keep in mind that graph that I showed you about who does not have automobiles, many of those individuals are low-wage workers, 
living in households without an automobile and reduced transit service due to lost revenue is disproportionately gonna hurt uh, low income non-white travelers. There's, there's no question uh, sort of about that. And there's been some, uh, you know, the, the major papers have written about this. So these are examples from uh, both coasts, one from the New York Times and the second from the, from the LA Times, uh, worrying about the state of, uh, of public, uh, public transit. And I'm sure there's been a lot of articles written uh, about this. Um, the third, and this is what's always a little bit surprising to me, is that the benefits of automobiles to low-income families are, are widely recognized, at least widely recognized outside of my own field of, of, of urban planning. Uh, so first, it's important to note that a very high percentage of the population, including low-income households, own vehicles or live in households where there's at least one vehicle in the household. So it's kind of flipping that graph that I showed on, on its head. So certainly those households are, you know, non-white low-income households are more likely to be zero vehicle households, but many of them do live in households with cars. And so that's what you can see. These are not, these are from the, the US Census American Community Survey data. Uh, showing that. So in general, if you look at this sort of the, the poor bar, so living below the, the poverty line, about 80% of individuals in poor households have at least one car, one vehicle in the household. Okay, so the 20% is, is, you know, higher than uh, for, for other groups, but still most, uh, most folks, regardless of income, uh, are getting around in an, in an automobile. The second point to make here is that there is a body of literature that shows what happens when households actually get additional resources. What do they do with the additional resources that they get? And you don't have to guess, given the nature of my talk this afternoon, that they often use those additional resources to, to purchase uh, sort of vehicles. And so that's uh, kind of what you see on, on this table. You know, when we see when the economy is doing better, there's a decline in unemployment, we see an increase in vehicle purchases, um, also an increase typically in vehicle miles of travel. Um, we have an earned income tax credit program in the U.S., which is probably the biggest benefit for uh, low-income families that we, we have in the U.S. Um, and there's a literature on what do you do when you get that tax credit? And a very high percentage are using that, those returns, those tax returns to purchase vehicles. Um, there are individual development accounts, which is a program, sort of a matched savings account program. Um, and I've looked at, again, you know, they're supposed to be to help start up businesses, to purchase homes. So they have a lot of different purposes. And in some of those programs that do allow auto purchases, not all of them do, um, auto purchases wind up being the, you know, sort of the largest uh, asset uh, sort of investment. And then there's more qualitative uh, sort of research where, you know, where there'll be interviews with welfare participants. So individuals uh, receiving uh, sort of public benefits. And many of those say, you know, when I get a job, what I need to do is purchase a vehicle. That's gonna make my, my, my life a lot uh, easier. Um, and then the third point here is that there are numerous efforts by poverty and civil rights organizations to protect and enhance the rights of people to, to drive. And I'm only going to present a, sort of a few of them here. So this first graph is about vehicle asset limitations for, in this case, the graph is for SNAP, which is a food assistance, a federal food assistance program and the growth in allowing at least one vehicle exemption in order to be eligible for this federal uh, benefit. Um, and so there are similar efforts around other public assistance programs uh, as, as well. And you can see the, the growth over, over time. 
The second, and I've been doing some research on, uh, on, on this, um, a lot of the immigrant organizations have been organizing, actively organizing to pass state laws, allowing undocumented immigrants to obtain a driver's license. And so we've been doing some analysis in California. The, the law changed in California. We've been sort of looking at the impact that has had actually on driving and transit use in the, in the state. Um, but the map you see here is from the National Immigration Law Center. And you can see those states in blue that do offer driver's licenses regardless of immigration status. And on the right, uh, sort of pictures of of, of folks organizing uh, for this right. Um, the third example are legal efforts by civil rights and poverty organizations to end driver's license suspensions for non-driving reasons. Um, and so you can see the map on states that do suspend driver's license over unpaid fees. So these are fees that have nothing to do with the driver's license. Uh, and then the, the map on the right is looking at revoked licenses by state. And so the civil rights organizations, I just wrote uh, sort of a statement, there's a big lawsuit in South Carolina uh, to overturn uh, their state law on, on this. And think about this, it, you know, it has all kinds of implications, one related to driving, but you know, sitting on juries, uh, voting, you know, on and on. So huge implications and major racial uh, sort of disparities in uh, driver's licenses uh, suspensions. And then finally, um, there are a number of low income automobile ownership programs uh, in, in, in the US and they all function in slightly different ways um, and with different kinds of financial support and, and, and whatnot. Um, trying to figure out uh, how to get uh, low-income households to have greater access to, to, uh, to an automobile, specifically you know, for the, the purposes of uh, employment often. So you can see Wheels for Work even has that uh, in, their, in their title. Um, okay, so um, equity, sustainability and, and automobility. So this is kind of the, the, the last thing I'd like to say and then kind of open it up for discussion and, and comments is that um, I think these efforts, I mean, you know, sort of given the benefits of uh, automobiles, I think that these uh, sort of national efforts are important uh, regardless. Um, but the argument I'd like to make in conclusion is that it is possible to pursue policies to improve equity, sustainability, and automobility. Um, and I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, sort of four things. So the first is we need to move beyond car-based planning um, by adopting policies to manage driving, okay? Um, we spend a lot of time trying to hand out carrots, you know, uh, you know, to get people to use transit or to bike or to walk, okay? Um, but I think to fundamentally transform cities in the ways that I too would like um, we have to move beyond uh, sort of car-based uh, uh, sort of planning. Um, Low-income households already use cars less than higher-income households. They already drive less than higher-income households, okay? Um, ideally, we ought to manage driving so that those households actually that have cars, the higher-income households with cars, use them less, use them more judiciously. That's what we ought to be aiming for. And it is possible, and it's certainly what I'm arguing here, is that those without cars who are disproportionately poor or disproportionately non-white, who desperately need access uh, to uh, 
you know, jobs and services that are more easily as, uh, accessed by automobiles, um, they might need to drive more, okay? Um, in other words, I, we should not be pursuing our environmental, our sustainability goals at the expense of low-income households. So it really comes back to this point number one, I think, to achieve some of the objectives, both equity and sustainability, um, we really need to move beyond car-based planning by adopting policies where we're sort of better managing uh, the automobile and, and driving. The second is that, um, you know, we need to increase the supply of affordable housing. Um, so low-income households can self-select into neighborhoods that do meet their transportation needs, whatever those needs may be. So it may be perfectly fine living in a very dense urban neighborhood to make all trips on public transit, walking, biking, all of that. Uh, but very difficult if you so choose to self-select in those neighborhoods when there is such a severe, as is the case in many large US cities, including Los Angeles, where there is such a huge lack of affordable housing that it's very hard uh, to adjust your housing needs uh, to meet your transportation needs or have them both be in, in, in sync. Third, um, that another way uh, of addressing sustainability and automobiles is to adopt policies to encourage the retirement of gross polluting vehicles. So low-income households tend to, to own older vehicles uh, that, are, that are more likely to be gross polluting. We actually use data um, from the Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles to map these out. And the high there are very, very high concentrations of these sort of older gross polluting vehicles located in, uh, in low-income neighborhoods. And so um, we need to do that. Um, so the retirement, and that needs to be coupled with the fourth point here, which is to adopt policies to subsidize the purchase or the use, not necessarily the ownership, but also the use of cleaner fuel vehicles. And so the graph, I mean the graph, the, the image on the right, the Clean Vehicle Assistance Program is a program that, that the California Air Resources Board has to do three and four uh, to help uh, sort of subsidize the retirement of gross polluting vehicles. And at the same time, provide uh, sort of uh, uh, an e economic incentives to purchase uh, uh, automobiles, cleaner fuel automobiles, uh, ideally electric vehicles. And then there are programs also um, that are focused on the use, not necessarily the, the ownership. So for example, um, there are a number also funded by the California Air uh, sort of Resources Board and resources from our cap and trade program, uh, sort of uh, 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 electric car sharing programs uh, as, as well. So a lot of interest in those. There's one in Los Angeles called Blue LA. Um, there's one in, the, in our state capital in Sacramento. So the number of these electric, low income electric car sharing programs as well, enabling people to have use of a vehicle when they need to, right? Not necessarily paying for a vehicle uh, that's sitting in their driveway or their parking garage, um, but be able to selectively use a vehicle when they need to go grocery shopping, for example, and then potentially making other trips by, by other modes. So I'll end it with, he, with, with uh, these points and I am uh, open to comments and questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, Evelyn. That was nice. <laughs> Uh, okay, lots of questions, and then they will be flooding even more. Uh, so let me let me start by uh, uh, one question by Margaret Ovenel. 
she, she's asking, do the benefits of owning a vehicle for low income households occur because our city planning and culture prioritize, prior, give priority to cars? And is there anything inherent about car ownership that makes it positive in, in on itself? Ask, I'm sorry, ask me the first part of the question again. Uh, do the benefits of owning a vehicle for low income households occur because our city planning and culture did prioritize car owner ownership? Yes. So I, I think that's exactly right. Um, that we've made a set of decisions um, and they have shaped what our cities look like. And if you go back to the first, uh, you know, sort of, I think it was the first graph that I presented on the sort of accessibility gaps by mode, it's not a surprise that they're narrower in metropolitan areas where, this, where much of the city developed prior to the automobile and wider in a city like Los Angeles, which where much of the development occurred after the automobile. Um, and so we have in, in many respects, structured uh, sort of cities around the automobile. And then in so doing, we turn around and we say, well, you know, what we really want is we don't want to encourage automobility among low income households, which puts them at a disadvantage, which is why, you know, at the, you know, with the last slide, I think that the difficult, and I think it's a very thorny political issue. Um, and we've been trying to sort of pull the, the various leaders in Los Angeles along with this is that we, we can't expect, I think we, we put too much on public transit. Um, we can't expect public transit to do everything or walking or biking or scooters or all of that um, unless we make some difficult policy uh, decisions to better manage the automobile. If we do that, cities will look different and everybody, not just low-income households, but all households will be able to get around using modes other than the, the, the automobile. Um, so I think if I understood the question, it's yes. <laughs> and there was a second part too. The, the second part, is there anything inherent about car ownership that makes it positive on, it, on, on itself? Yes, I don't think so. Um, We've had ownership along, you know, that the ownership option uh, for a, a, a long time. And now we have increasingly, you know, other options for automobility, right? So I mentioned car share, we have ride hailing, we have other kinds of, you know, given sort of the, the, the technological development in the sector, we have other, other options as, as well. I think that given urban structure that I talked about, I think that cars, to, even with congestion, cars are fast and allow and flexible and allow greater opportunity. So that's what that's what we have with with automobiles. I hope, and and this is you know kind of my hope, is that we move away from the ownership model. Uh, toward a model, I'm guessing, I don't see many of your faces, but I, I, am, I am guessing that most of you, in fact, I just cleaned out my attic and I had a box of cassette tapes and a box of CDs, okay? And I'm guessing you, most of you listening to this talk this afternoon, stream your music because I stream my music, okay? I haven't looked at those. I don't have anything to play those on anymore, right? I stream my music. Um, I think that, you know, I think it would be very helpful to move away from a model that, you know, of, I think in rural areas, in some areas, it will be difficult to do this, but in urban areas, I think it's possible to move away from a model of ownership toward a model of, of use so that we could think, you know, we, we will think for every trip, is this, I'm paying for this trip, is this a trip that I could take by transit or I could walk? Or is this a trip where I really need to have an automobile to, to make that, that trip? Um, and, you know, there it's, I think the verdict is still out uh, about, you know, sort of our, uh, our ability to do that. The last thing I will say is that not so much on the, on the 
auto use piece of this, but the paying for what you use is really, really beneficial to low income households. And so we see it in other aspects of policy. So for example, automobile insurance, you know, flat rates of, uh, you know, for automobile insurance, given that low income uh, travelers travel less than higher income households is a real big financial penalty. And some of the auto insurance, I don't know if they're doing this in Canada, but some of the auto insurance companies are moving away from that to more paper drive, you know, sort of more uh, uh, mileage based fees. So you, you know, paying for what you use, I think is important. And uh, there are increasingly options to do that related to automobiles as well. Okay. Lots of question now. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, 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 your answer triggered even more, more questions. So uh, <laughs> let, let me ask you this one from Julian. Uh, he's like, you have done, you have been focusing in the US a lot in, in most of your research, in many of your research, but when you compare to Europe, what, what do you think about like some of your findings when you compare the US to Europe in terms of the access to cars, the, the automobility, mind? I, I, I still remember in, in Netherlands, I, I, I was there and then I was asking uh, one of the professors and he said like, well, we have to accept that the Netherlands were a car oriented country. And I was like, really? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I think that the, the benefits of cars will vary relative to the, uh, you know, to the, the densities of, of cities uh, around the globe for, you know, at, 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 at for sure. Um, and I think that in some of these older cities with high densities, that gap, that access gap is far narrower. And by the way, even in US or Canadian cities, it varies by particular neighborhoods, right? So I've looked at this for Los Angeles. Um, you know, there are some neighborhoods where that transit auto gap is far narrower. And those are the areas I think where we need to make substantial investments in public transit, right? Or walking or biking, right? Um, and so that's true internationally as well. But I will say that, you know, if you look at, <laughs> And I haven't done this recently. And again, you know, my work does focus on the on the U.S. But you look at some of the the countries where there are the most rapid increases in automobile ownership. That rate of change, even though maybe the denominator is smaller, certainly than the U.S., which I just showed you. You know, most people have have cars. Uh, the rate of growth is pretty substantial in, in in many other places around the world. And there are other. You know, I gave you that sort of that. Uh, slide with the list of um, studies on automobile ownership and employment outcomes, but there are uh, similar studies elsewhere um, around the world, uh, including Tokyo, for example, you know, and if you've been to Tokyo, can't get better transit than Tokyo. I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing, right? Um, but still, you see some of these disparities playing out there as well. Um some of your research, I remember seeing a presentation by uh, like a paper you were involved in that looked at rural and urban stuff and people's differences in, in rural and urban. So one of the students is asking about uh, what are your thoughts about the inequalities in the US, for example, for urban and rural? Have you studied that? I remember it was like the, I think it was the paper with Eric on, on the happiness and the difference between urban and rural. That I saw for you, but have you looked at the the, the inequalities in car ownership in, in uh, between urban and rural? Yeah, a, a little bit, not so much. I mean, that that paper was you know kind of a that you're referring to was about sort of time use and yeah. uh, and city size and whatnot. But yeah, we've done a little bit of this work uh, in California, sort of comparing, and this is kind of older work of mine. Um, comparing Los Angeles and the, the San Francisco Bay Area to the Central Valley, in, which is, um, there are cities in the Central Valley, but it's, uh, you know, much residential and employment densities are far lower. 
and it is an agricultural based uh, economy. Uh, and the transit systems are kind of structured to, you know, kind of paratransit to bring you to a, a, you know, a city where then you can use transit to get to your final destination. So the transit systems are set up very differently. But I will tell you, you know, this was a project where we were focused on welfare participants. So largely single moms, poor single moms with kids and a higher percentage uh, of, uh, of those families in the Central Valley have a car. It's just impossible to function without an automobile. So automobile ownership rates are much higher uh, in rural areas than they are in, in urban areas where there are alternatives, right? Um, I mean, even if there are uh, disparities in access, modal disparities in access, there are alternatives. And in many rural areas, they're, they're not. And travel distances are, are, are relatively far as, as, as well. So I would say that it's even, it, it's even more important. I will also say that sort of thinking through the alternatives is a lot thornier, right? Because even some of these ride sharing programs, ride hailing programs, all of these sorts of programs still need certain levels of density to make them financially viable services. And in rural areas, that will be, uh, that will be difficult. And so those are, those are uh, you, know, you, you know what you see a lot of in those areas? You see a lot of not car sharing, like I was formal car sharing programs. You see in, in uh, these agricultural communities, you see a lot of workers sharing carpooling to their destination. So you see higher rates of carpooling. Um, but higher rates of car use. Uh, coming back to cities, uh, Misha Young from University of Toronto is asking, has the, the car to transit job access ratio increased over time, do you think? Like we've been investing in, in transit to, to tighten the gap and, and if so, has, has it increased as fast as we want it to be or as, as how the auto has been, auto oriented cities has been moving? Yeah. I'm, that's a great question, um, and I'm not sure I can answer that question because I think that that is that is one that where the the disparities across different areas uh, are going to be huge. So I would imagine that in some areas we have, like in Los Angeles, we're making huge investments in public transit, and in some of those neighborhoods, I would imagine that transit is doing better relative to, I mean, still, you know, it was, I, I showed you 13 times on average for Los Angeles, but I would imagine that in some of those neighborhoods where we really have been increasing the, the transit infrastructure, uh, those disparities have narrowed over time. But what I don't know, okay, so one is, you know, there is the, the the modal uh, access disparities, yeah? And then the question is, even if we're narrowing those disparities, what kind of an impact does that have? Has that changed uh, the impact on outcomes of being trust, like employment, right? And so I'm not sure about that, but I would imagine that in some areas, particularly, you know, areas where there have been substantial uh, sort of investments in, in, in transit infrastructure, we have narrowed those somewhat. Uh, and then the question is, is it enough to make, you know, substantial differences in employment rates, for example? I'm not certain. Um, Samantha Kerr from McGill, she's asking, in terms of adopting policies to manage, manage driving practices, is there a policy or a model in place currently that has succeeded in regulating the car use and at the same time, uh, meeting some of the equity um, uh, goals you think about? Yeah, so I, you know, so what we, and, and some of my colleagues have been doing the work uh, on, on this, but um, yeah, so we've been really pushing uh, congestion pricing, for example. Um, and, and there can, depending on how it's been implemented. I know there are equity concerns. I think a lot of the, you know, sort of elected officials in Southern California are concerned about this. And I just had a conversation with some from the regional planning agency about, you know, sort of thinking about how to implement those, uh, those policies so they don't have a negative effect on low-income travelers. Um, 
but you know some of the pricing policies. I mean, the way we do this now, so for example, some of the, the financing that we're doing with the local option sales taxes, sales taxes are hugely regressive, right? So we need to really think through the, the, the finance piece as it relates to the automobile. Um, you know, free parking, you know, it's really easy. You can go to the market, you think, oh, I could walk, but oh, there's free parking. You know, I'm just gonna, you know, drive and, and pick up some things. So there are things that we can do. I think that the, the real big challenge here is a political one. Um, a lot of those higher income folks with cars are voters. They vote regularly, you know, um, and they want the flexibility, you know, even if they use transit to get to work, for example, you know, pre-COVID, um, they were using transit to get to work. They want that flexibility to be able to use their automobile. It's really hard for elected officials to say, we're going to manage that better, right? You know what I mean? And um, I think that that's the, the big challenge. Um, but that's the, I think that that's, that's what's going to change land use in Los Angeles, for example. Um, so we are, we are trying very hard. We're tinkering at the margins to, you know, increase uh, sort of densities around rail stations, do all of those things. But I really think to have a substantial uh, sort of effect, um, we're going to have to manage driving. Um, and once we do that, then I think it, everybody's going to make a slightly different set of, of, of choices. But the political barriers are steep and we're very, very slowly kind of moving people in that direction, moving, you know, uh, uh, elected officials and others, you know, uh, to that, so. Uh, a question from uh, Jamie Deweese, uh, Deweese uh, there's a pretty clear difference between automobility and auto dependency. So, have you found clear differences between necessary driving trips and wholly discretionary uh, wants among different socioeconomic groups? So are uh, like the low income doing uh, less of the VMT, they are just doing the necessary stuff or they are doing as much as unneeded trips like some of the high income as we have seen in Montreal, for example? Yeah, it's a good question. Like I don't know. I have not done that. Uh, I, I have not done that analysis. So I don't know. Sometimes it's difficult, at least with the public data, maybe not with, uh, you know, with other survey data to try to figure out. I mean, there's a couple of challenges to try to figure out what is discretionary and what is not, you know what I mean? Because we just don't have great data uh, to do that. And then the other question, which you didn't ask, which is also difficult to get, which I bet, you know, Ahmed has talked about, it's hard to know whether there's a latent demand for trips as well. What trips are people taking? Like, you know, in the travel surveys, we just see the trips that they do take. Um, and are they not taking certain trips? And some of those could be discretionary. Some of those could, you know, be, you know, kind of not discretionary, right? Um, essential uh, sort of trips that they're minimizing because they don't have, uh, the means to, to get to where they need to go. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Great question. I just don't know. I have not looked at that, but that's an excellent question. Okay. Kimberly Salt, she's one of the students taking the class uh, for, for credit. She's asking, in, in the graph that you showed from Apple, uh, the, the, the requests for walking and cycling and driving, uh, she, she said, like, we see that the car and the walking went up and yeah. way higher than the previous levels. So uh, while the transit was flat, uh, to what extent do you, do you think that the investments in active transport that happened in COVID can be related to that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And you know, um, I just attended a session yesterday at another conference and they were talking about not exactly these data, but other data. So yeah, so it's a, it's a great point. What you saw in that graph is I mean, all travel has gone up, including travel by uh, by public transit. But the the walking and the driving has gone up to at least, if not more, than uh, sort of pre-pandemic uh, uh, levels. And someone asked that exact question. Um, so it it could be. So you know, I know on the on the walking side of things, um, there have been, and I have an interest in this as well. 
there's been, you know, safe streets programs, you know, they've closed streets, made them so that you could walk and bike and be socially distant, you know, on them. So there has been some sort of COVID response. I will say likely, you know, that may have contributed. Um, but the other thing that's happening is that far fewer people are using public transit. And so they've also shifted to other modes. Other so that likely has explained, uh, explained that uh, in, in, in part. Uh, but great question. Uh, I don't think we know entirely, um, but it's probably some mode shifting. Um, some, they were talking yesterday about, you know, also I think that the, the time of day in which people are traveling, that doesn't show up on this Apple routing graph, but that's also changed as well, right? With so many people working from, uh, from home. So yeah, good question. Yeah, uh, we're on time now. So I have a lot of questions, but unfortunately we have to wrap up. Thank you so much, Evelyn. It's always a pleasure to hear your talks and get inspired with them. We have a lot to think about. So uh, thank you so much for coming and, and giving us some of your time for the students and for the public as well who uh, attended the seminar. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's, it's my pleasure. It's terrific. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you soon in person at some yes. point. Yes. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.